hands together to welcome Chris Hedges. He would have been stripped of his committee chairmanship 
And like Nader, I was Nader's uh, speech where I wrote speeches for Ralph in 2008. I, was, I remember once speaking at the University of Wisconsin, and several of the students said afterwards, well, we love Nader, but his speeches were so boring. <laughs> um, I thought they were just riveting myself. Uh, it's a very odd experience, by the way, to write a speech for somebody, which are all your words, and then read it in the paper and say, and then Ralph Nader said, and Ralph Nader. Um, but obviously he has cut a deal with the Democrats, uh, and, and that deal fundamental, that, what is fundamental to that deal is that he will endorse the candidate, uh, and we're watching what looks like the Clinton coronation. Uh, um, and so that by next April he's finished, <laughs> And then he serves that kind of Van Jones role of funneling all of this hope, all of this passion, all of this work, and a significant amount of money right back into a dead political system. Um, and we don't have time for that anymore. Uh, we don't have time to fool around. Um, we have to get militant very fast. Um, and even then, we are going to suffer tremendous economic dislocation, dislocation from climate change. Um, I wrote a book called Death of the Liberal Class, uh, which goes all the way back to World War I and describes the breakdown of our political institutions, the destruction of our radical movements, um, which really began in World War I with the rise of the Committee of Public Information uh, Creel Commission, uh, and the war against not only socialists like Eugene V. Debs, but the old Communist Party, uh, the anarchists, of course, uh, all of these radical movements that had fused and radicalized labor. Um, and remember that the labor wars in the United States were the most violent in any industrialized country. Hundreds upon hundreds of American workers were murdered by gun thugs, uh, Pinkertons, Baldwin Feltz, state militias to give us the middle class, to give us the eight hour workday, which is now being taken away from us, to protect us from child labor, to make possible pensions and, uh, and, and, and medical benefits. Um, and uh, on the eve of World War I, these populist forces especially inspired by the Russian Revolution, terrified the power elite. Remember, the old FBI was created in 1908, and it was really composed of a bunch of goons and thugs, not that they're not goons and thugs today, in case any of the FBI are here, um, uh, who went in along with vigilante groups like the old American Legion, which was right-wing World War I veterans, to break groups like the Wobblers. Um, there's a wonderful moment, actually, where there's a dock strike. I think it's San Francisco. Uh, so the Wobblies are run, running the strike, and they're sending down uh, in ships from Seattle and other places groups of Wobblies to back the workers. And as they're coming down the gangplank, the San Francisco police are there with their truncheon beating all of them, and, the, and they're shouting out at the Wobblies, where are your leaders? Where are your leaders? And the Wobblies say, we're all leaders. We're all leaders. Um, all of us have to stand up now like that. Um, there is no time left. Uh, and we have to recover that radical ethic, and we have to be rebuild those mass movements that have been destroyed in the name of anti-communism. Um, what we entered after World War I, as Dwight MacDonald, a writer I admire very much, is not read anymore, unfortunately. He's also, also a great stylist, beautiful writer's literary essays. His essay on James Joyce is one of the great essays on Joyce. His takedown of Hemingway, you have to read. Um, um, he's also written, he wrote a couple of essays that were very important to me. The Root is Man, Mass Cult, Mid Cult was a very important essay for me. Mass Cult, Mid Cult challenged the left, saying don't dumb down your message to make it popular. Yes, you may reach a broader spectrum, um, but you will dilute the message to such an extent that you will destroy its capacity to 
generate radical change, that all of us who care have to keep speaking the way figures like Noam Chomsky do at that highest level and not pander to the cliches that are endemic within popular culture, mass call him info. Um, he wrote a book, he wrote a book, uh, where he, uh, um, a book of essays, and he described, I, he made a brilliant point for me about World War I. He said at the end of World War I, we entered what he called a psychosis of permanent war. And by that, he, he meant that, you know, you, you have this culture where you're constantly, the state sustains itself through fear and by constantly searching to ferret out internal and external enemies. And he said none of the political theorists, including Karl Marx, anticipated this psychosis of permanent war. Um, and he was right. And that psychosis of permanent war has served corporate capitalism extremely well. So, if you, if you read Ellen Trecker's great work, uh, No uh, Such Were the Crimes, No Ivory Tower, Work on the Purging of the Universities, you understand that thousands upon thousands of people with a conscience, they weren't communists, of course, but they were people who were willing to stand up within the system for justice, were purged out of every institution, the church, academia, even high schools. So FBI agents would show up in high schools with a list of people they wanted blacklisted, never any evidence, those people would be fired immediately and then they would be, they would be unable to get work anywhere else. And it decimated our landscape and left us. So the movements were broken, e purges even within the ACLU. Uh, you had figures like I. F. Stone, our greatest investigative journalist, becomes a pariah because of the McCarthy era. Um, he can't get a job even at the Nation magazine and he starts High of Stones Weekly in the basement, musicians, artists. Um, and then I wrote Empire Revolution, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, which is because corporate, uh, or corporate totalitarianism, which is a species of totalitarianism, uh, th these totalitarian systems always, uh, do, they, they thrive through spectacle and image. That's what they do really well. And you see it through a uh, sports complex, you know, the, the professional sports, uh, Hollywood. Um, uh, I was, uh, when I was here, my wife was in a play at the Huntington uh, last year, so we were all here. It was very good for me. It was very humbling because theater people have no idea who I am. I was just the older husband with the kids going backstage saying, okay, I'm going to the aquarium now. <laughs> and you have a great aquarium, by the way. Um, And um, so what happened is that the, the cultural landscape, the intellectual landscape, all of it was eviscerated. And the mechanisms that we had to protect ourselves were taken from us. Um, we commercialized everything, including art, um, and we walked away from a print-based culture, which is deadly. I, I wrote a column, I read a column in Truth Dig every Monday, this is Bob Shear's great website out of LA, uh, and I had done an event in New York on Saturday at the Left Forum with uh, Rick Wolf, the great Marxist economist, and Gail Dines, who's at Neelock College, who I admire very much. Uh, this radical Marxist feminist who's uh, quite courageously taken on uh, the porn industry as well as uh, the trafficking of prostituted women. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, I was terrified to do the event with them, frankly, because I don't have, they're, they're both, they all both have doctorates, she and, as a Marxist historian, he is a Marxist economist. Um, but I wrote this column, which we opened the session with, you know, talking about how Marx was right. Uh, you can't understand the nature of capitalism if you don't sit down and read the first volume of Das Kapital. Um, you're never going to get that off the internet. You're never going to get that off of uh, television. You've got to read. And Rick and I, in some despair, worry that the left is not grounded in significant or serious revolutionary theory. So we're doing these 10 talks, C-SPAN is filmed, 
the first two. We did the first one with Cornell West on Thomas Paine. We did this one on Marx. We're going to do Gramsci. We're going to do Rosa Luxemburg, Kropotkin, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Franz Fanon, in the hopes that it will trigger people to invest themselves in that, that great archive of revolutionary theory, serious revolutionists who looked for the triggers and mechanisms of revolt. Um, uh, and that's, that is the book. It's a, it's a book about the danger of severing yourself from a world of ideas and being enveloped by these electronic hallucinations. And the longest chapter in the book is on the porn industry because we're a completely pornified society and the danger of what pornography does. I was a war correspondent for 20 years and in every war that I covered there was an explosion not only of prostitution but of porn because it's exactly the same phenomenon. In war you turn human beings into objects to destroy or gratify or both and uh, there's an explosion in war of hyper-masculinity and male violence and domination against women. Um, and the fact that we are a, a, you know, a culture that now slavishly worships quote-unquote military values, hyper-masculine values, and because of the infusion of pornography within the society, um, it, it is creating a deeply kind of demented world view. Uh, uh, and, uh, and one that I think is, you know, fits in the world of neoliberalism where everybody becomes a commodity uh, to exploit, including, of course, women. Um, and then I wrote Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt with Joe Sacco, the great cartoonist. I hate to call him a cartoonist. He's, he's one of the most brilliant reporters I've ever worked with. We uh, met, actually, in Bosnia. And... Um, I didn't, had never heard of him, and I'm not a reader of graphic novels. Uh, I was covering the war for the New York Times. The war had just ended, and we were going to the safe area of garage, and I watched this, I, so I went with him in a French convoy, and I watched this guy work, and instantly at least realized that he was one of the most brilliant reporters I'd ever met. His book, Footnotes in Gaza, which he spent six years writing, is one of the great books ever written on the Palestine-Israel conflict. Um, and I, when I got it, I, actually it was a Thanksgiving day, and I got up at about seven before my kids woke up and sat, and it destroyed me, and then I was weeping at the end of it. It is one of the most powerful evocations of the suffering of the Palestinian people, because he draws it, and he writes it, and he reports it. Um, so I wanted to do a book on the sacrifice zones in American society, uh, those places where corporate capitalism has walked in to destroy the environment, to destroy community, to destroy human lives. Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States. Uh, uh, we went to the coal fields of southern West Virginia, uh, where, of course, the tops are being blown off the Appalachian Mountains, billion gallon impoundment ponds filled with, uh, you know, heavy metals and lead and toxins, uh, the air is fetid, the water is poisoned, you go to these old hollows, everybody's had their gallbladder removed, you walk into the nurse's office in the elementary school and there's rows of little inhalers, uh, cancer is an epidemic, um, uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where at any one time 60% of the residents of Pine Ridge have neither electricity or running water, many live in sod huts, the average life expectancy for a male is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of Haiti. This is America. It's not America they'll show you, but it is increasingly America. The idea was to say we've now, in an age of unfettered, unregulated capitalism, we've become one vast sacrifice zone. And you better look at what happened in these sacrifice zones because this is what they're about to do to you. And, and what they're about to do to you in Massachusetts is named Kinder Morgan. <laughs> and Spectre. And Spectre. And, and so this book that I wrote, Wages of Rebellion, is different from those three. And that I'm no longer arguing about whether we should revolt. I'm no longer attempting to analyze what's happened. 
I look at the mechanics of rebellion itself, what the state does, the kinds of people who rebel, the price that they pay, and finally the moral imperative of revolt. Because in an age of radical evil, and we live in an age of radical evil, revolt should not be carried about out for its efficacy or for what it can achieve, but finally for who it allows us to become. And I come out of a faith tradition, um, went to Harvard Divinity School, although Harvard Divinity School has probably produced more atheists than any other divinity school in America. <laughs> it's a very strange place, Harvard Divinity School. I lived in Roxbury at the time, on commute from, I lived across from uh, Mission Main Mission Extension Housing Project, which when I lived there was, was a rough place. Um, and I always say that traveling every day to Harvard Divinity School to Cambridge and coming back to Roxbury cured me of, of uh, having anything to do with liberals. Um, all those people who were talking about empowering people they never met, who liked the poor but didn't like the smell of the poor, who would go down at the time to the Sandinista government in Nicaragua and pick coffee for a week and spend the rest of the semester talking about it, but wouldn't get on the green line for a 20 minute ride when people were being warehoused in their own city like animals. And that was the great failing of the left in that we busied ourselves with a kind of boutique activism, multiculturalism, identity politics. All of this is anti-politics. I was just with two really impressive activists from Ferguson, a young woman and a rap artist named T.W.O. And T.W.O. was invited to the White House with a small group of activists to meet Obama, and Obama asked him if he voted for him, and T.W.O. said, no, I didn't vote for you because you haven't done anything for black people. And then he said, to vote for you because you're black would be shallow, which shows a level of political sophistication that eluded much of the rest of us. Um, the, the particular gender or identity of a person, the personality, and presidential campaigns are about selling you manufactured personalities. And the refusal to look at politics has, of course, been our downfall. Um, and it's something that has to end, and it has to end very, very quickly. Um, I teach in a prison. I have for several years. Uh, and you would think that teaching in a prison is kind of depressing. Um, not that prisons aren't depressing. Um, but it is certainly the most empowering day of my week. Um, there is a level of political sophistication and resistance and integrity and brilliance that is unlike anything I have ever found in any classroom I have ever been in and I have taught at Princeton, Columbia, NYU. Um, and that's, of course, part of the tragedy of mass incarceration where We've criminalized poverty, where we've taken what Marx understood to be our surplus labor, redundant labor, which is worth nothing to corporations on the streets of Roxbury. Uh, but when you put these black and brown bodies in cages, they can generate fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year for the prison contractors and the money transfer services like JPay, and the phone service companies like Global Telling, and the prison commissaries. And, and of course, what they have done, again, is it's a window into what they want to do to the rest of us when you see, when, when they go after and exploit the vulnerable, the weakest, the people who have no capacity to push back. So families who have people who are incarcerated are being bled for money. If you send $20 into a commissary account, you're charged 
by JPay or one of the transfer money transfer services, four dollars and ninety-five cents. If you want to, well, I got a list of 1996 commissary prices and a list today. Everything is up by over 100 percent, and it's it's complete exploitation. If you buy a pack of a hundred legal size envelopes at Staples, it'll cost you seven dollars. In a prison, they cost fifteen cents an envelope. That's fifteen dollars. That's over a hundred percent market. But you only make twenty-eight dollars a month in New Jersey. I don't know what Massachusetts is a dollar thirty a day. And of course, now what they're doing is stripping basic items. And you're not issued shoes in New Jersey. You have to buy forty-five dollars pairs of Reeboks. You have to pay for your medical visits. If you have uh, an immediate family member who is either terminally ill or, or has died, you get a 15-minute visit, either a viewing or a deathbed visit, but they charge you the overtime for the guards. It's $900. And now we're watching prisoners with sentences 30 years. They've worked every day of their life. Walking out of prison systems in this country in debt, without Social Security, of course, and if they can't pay back that debt, and if you've got a felony conviction that you know how hard it is to get a job, you go right back in. That's why they have such a high recidivism rates. They stack it to make it almost impossible for you to survive on the outside. There's only so long you can sleep on your sister's couch. And it's important that we look at that prison system like looking at these sacrifice zones because prisoners are the model workers for the corporate state. And that's why so many corporations are now inside the prisons. Target, Johnson & Johnson, Hewlett Packard, Victoria's Secret, Starbucks. There's a very long list. And we now have prison administrators going to corporations and saying, you don't need to hire sweatshop workers in Bangladesh for 22 cents an hour. We have people right here in America that earn 22 cents an hour. And you don't have to pay benefits. Um, they always show up on time. Uh, they have no voice. Any time of collective bargaining, they'll end up in solitary confinement. Every area where corporations go, whether it is the sacrifice zones or the prison system, remember we have 25% of the world's prisoners and 5% and, and of the world's population, you, you see the vision of the future. You see what it is they intend to do to the rest of us. And slowly, they have been chipping away at all of our physical rights and our legal rights. If you go back and read Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, she speaks about the phenomena of the stateless. She herself fled Germany, picked up by the Gestapo, was almost killed by the Gestapo, stripped of her citizenship, stripped of her papers, walk out this door tonight, and you can see undocumented workers who are living in this country in the same state, the same condition. And she said, when you create a segment of a society, and this has been done towards undocumented workers, it's been done towards people who live in marginal communities who are stripped of their rights, so, I know from teaching in the system, only 94%, I mean, uh, of, of the 94% of people who are incarcerated never got a trial. If you actually, if everybody got a trial, the system would break down. It's not built to offer trials. And what they do is stack you with so many charges that you have to negotiate with the prosecutor the best you can, even though they know that half or more of those charges, maybe all of them, you never committed. And it's always their word against yours, and yours doesn't count. I have a student, and this is part of the reason I teach in the prison, I have a student, he was picked up in Camden, New Jersey, and there was a knifing. I think he was present, but I'm certain he didn't do it. He was only 14, but there was a knifing and somebody was killed. And the police grabbed him and hauled him into the Camden police station and wouldn't let any of his family into the room. And he was frightened and he was crying and he was terrified 
and they say, just sign, and you go home. Just sign it. And it was a confession, and he signed it, and they threw him for two years at the top of the Camden County Jail at the age of 14, which is where all the felony charges were. And at 16, he was tried as an adult, and he's not eligible to go before a parole board until he's 70. He was in my class last semester. I've had him in a couple classes. He's my best student. He was my, I may go in that prison, but I, I'm still a son of a bitch in terms of getting an A from. He was my only A+. Plus. <laughs> and he waited until everyone had left. If I would mention a book, like the night, like men mentioning Roland, he would read it. I mean, it wasn't on the syllabus, but he would just read it. Everyone leaves the class. He's the last one in the room. And he says... I know I'm going to die in this prison, but I'm going to become a teacher like you. I run into that kind of integrity. Um, and when you see how these people have been demonized by the wider society, reality shows on prisons where every prisoner is an animal. I'm in prisons all the time. And my experience with people who are incarcerated, my students, is that we're discussing James Baldwin or Richard Wright. But that doesn't make good dramatic TV and it doesn't conform to the stereotypes that justify this pernicious system of mass incarceration. Um, and because they are victims of the system, they understand the system with a clarity that eludes most of the rest of us. I gave a talk at a church, a wealthy church in New Jersey. Um, why they invited me, I don't know. It will never happen again. <laughs> For Peace and Justice Sunday. They thought that would be nice to bring me. <laughs> and it was when I got to the part of the sermon where I said, we have decapitated far more people with our militarized drones, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated, that the exodus began to the back door. And I was teaching, uh, at the time, W.E.B. Du Bois's um, uh, Souls of Black Folks. And Du Bois is very patrician and elitist. And he talks about the talented tent. So that talented tent of blacks, um, and the rest should, you know, be carpenters or something. And my class said, well, we're not the talented tent. And I said, well, let me tell you why the voice was wrong. And I told them what I had said in the sermon. And they understood perfectly that when you brutalize people, they become brutal. When you go to a place like Iraq and you bomb people for over 10 years, in the same way that we bomb people in Cambodia, you produce an ISIS or you produce a Pol Pot. And you get a Jordanian pilot held in a cage and burned alive because their families are being incinerated day in and day out by the U.S. Air Force, but they don't have an Air Force. And so they burn the pilot in the way their families are being burned, it's cruder, but morally, there's no difference. And they instantly understand that with a clarity that eluded that upper middle class white church where everybody had at least a BA and probably graduate degrees. And I think for those of us who care about resistance, it's important, and that's one of the points I make in the book, that we maintain real relationships, especially if we're white and male, with the oppressed. And not relationships of charity, but relationships where we come with the humility, where we say, our privilege makes us blind. And it does make us blind. I learned this. I spent 20 years in the developing world. No matter how hard I tried to understand what it was like to be a Palestinian in Gaza, or what it is like to be an African-American man 
who was arrested at the age of 14 and knows he can't even go before a parole board until he's 70. And that doesn't mean to be released, by the way. That just means he can ask to be released. And I think when you build those close relationships and you acknowledge your own blindness, that's what King Lear is about. It is about privilege makes you unable to see. And Lear can only see when he is stripped of his power, naked on the heath. No matter how hard I try, there will always be that gap. And if you honor that gap, and you acknowledge that blindness, and you invest yourself emotionally and physically with those who suffer and are oppressed within this system of inverted totalitarianism, it is strangely empowering. Because I can't walk out that prison free and not fight for it. I can't walk out that prison and not think of that. I helped them write a play. I taught drama last year. August Wilson, um, Dutchman, the, the brother-sister plays by McNally. And that first class, I said I, I was going to have an experiment. I was going to have them every week write scenes, dramatic scenes, out of their own life. And the prison always has this, when I brought the papers home, I had 28 students, it always has that kind of musty smell to it. And I'm reading through, reading through, and I hit one scene that's brilliant. And then I hit another scene that's brilliant. And I had attracted to the class four or five of the best writers in the prison. And I went back and the same thing happened. And the third week it happened again. And I was supposed to be writing this book. And I didn't tell my publisher, but I dropped it. And I added another night every week. And I spent four months helping them hammer together a play about their life inside a prison called Cage. And at the end of the semester, we couldn't read it, obviously, in front of the prison authorities. I invited Cornell West and James Cohn to come be our audience. Um, and then Cohn and West spoke to the class, um, which was deeply moving, especially Cohn. And if you've not read The Cross and the Lynching Tree, you better get it. It's the most important work of theology in the last two or three decades. And it's about lynching and the fact that lynching is the crucifixion. And yet, the white church and white society couldn't see the crucifixion before their eyes. In the same way that the murder of black men and women and streets of the city are lynchings. Um, so I invited Cone and Cornell, and when we got to the entrance of the prison, the warden was there, and the major, the highest uniformed official, and they said, you're not going to your classroom, you're going to the chapel. And when we got to the chapel, we had a kind of phalanx of corrections officers. Uh, and my class got in a kind of huddle to decide what parts of the play they could read and what parts they couldn't. And one of the parts they read, which was autobiographical, was by a student who, when I had given the assignment, I said, go home this week, or this week, I want you to write a scene of a, just a discussion with your mother. Just nothing dramatic, just something you remember sitting at a kitchen table or a moment with your mother. And this student came up afterwards and said, well, what if we're a product of rape? And I said, well, Timmy, that's what you have to write. And that 
was read in the play, and it is autobiographical, and what it was, was he was in Patterson, New Jersey, with his half-brother, and their car was stopped by police, and there was a gun in the car, and it was his half-brother's. And if no one took possession or ownership of the gun, everybody would have been charged. And Timmy said, it's mine. And he recorded the phone call from jail where he said, it doesn't matter, Mom. I was never supposed to be here anyway, and you have the son you love. And he got up and read this. And then afterwards, I, I'm, they all, all they do is lift weights in there. I'm like one of the munchkins, you know, in my classroom. I said, where is Timmy? And they said, I think he's in the bathroom. I found him shaking and curled up in the corner of the bathroom. There's, in August Wilson's play, Joe Turner Come and Gone, which is set in a boarding house in Pittsburgh in 1910 with African-American families trying to recover from the trauma of slavery, um, the terror, trying to refine their families. There's a conjurer named Joe Loomis who said, you have to find your song. He keeps telling the characters, you have to find your song. And I met with my class one more night after that reading. And I remember one of my students who had been on death row, he stood up at the beginning of the class and he said, well, you may have seen that I was crying last night. Um, I've been in this system since 1984, and the night that Dr. Cohn and Dr. West came to speak to us was the only happy night I've ever spent in prison and he sat down. And after Dr. Cohn and Dr. West left, at the school room in the prison where I teach, they put pictures of Cornell West and James Cohn up at the entrance of the school because that's who they all want to become. And so they sign, all of them sign that last moment of the class, they all sign the front of the script. And I said, this is your song. And I said, I don't know anything about producing theater. But I'm going to take it to every theater director in New York. And I did. And it will be produced in January in New York. And when I went back and told my students, <laughs> everyone said the same thing, which is, can our families come? And I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to bust and do it on opening night, and they're all going to be there. I was in Montana a few weeks ago, and I had given them the syllabus, so they knew that Wednesday I wasn't going to be there. And I was in my hotel room in Montana, and I got a phone call, and they said, hello, this is the Special Investigations Division of the Department of Corrections of New Jersey. Do you know that your students just organized a sit-down strike in our prison? <laughs> and we think you're behind it. <laughs> now, I don't know why they think that. <laughs> and I was banned from the prison until I came in for my own interrogation. But when I hung that up, when I hung up that phone, that embodied everything I wrote about in this book. Because they knew damn well what was going to happen to them. Their cells were going to be stripped. They were going to be interrogated and threatened with solitary, which if you go into solitary long enough, it usually drives you insane. The leaders were going to be found out and shipped off to another prison and put in solitary. And yet they rose up anyway. And the heroism, the incredible heroism to stand up 
against these inhuman forces of oppression, knowing full well that the whole weight was going to come down upon you to assert their dignity and their resistance and their integrity and their power in the face of overwhelming oppression. And that's where I get my power from. From watching people who endure what probably very few people in this room can imagine and yet rise up anyway. And that's what we have to do. We have to stop asking what's practical. We have to stop putting our faith in the powerful because the powerful have sold us out. Yes, they have very sophisticated forms of propaganda. But they're not going to save us. We're only going to save ourselves. And we have no time left. None. I have four children. I'm terrified for their future. What will our children say about us if we don't put our bodies on our line and we don't resist these forces, in theological terms, forces of death that are extinguishing the very possibility of life and possibly, if left unchecked, the human species itself. Those are the moral questions that face us. And we have a responsibility to them. Even if I fail, and I don't like going to jail, it's more time than I care to donate to my government. Even if I fail, at least my children will say he tried. And of course, what we must do is, as Václav Havel says in his great 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, it means we must live in truth. We must name those systems of power for what they are, and we must defy them. All revolutions, successful revolutions, are fundamentally nonviolent. And remember, what we call the American Revolution was colonial occupation. And the British, who were the imperial power of their age, sent Prussian mercenaries, huge armadas, to shell and seize New York. But revolutions, which are organic against organic entities, are nonviolent. So when the Cossacks are sent in to crush the bread riots in Petrograd and refuse to fire on the demonstrators and begin to fraternize with the crowd, the Tsar is finished. They rush him back from the front. He abdicates in a railway carriage on a railway siding. All the revolutions in Eastern Europe, I was in East Germany. Eric Honecker, a communist dictator, sends down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd in Leipzig. They refuse. Honecker is out in another week of power. The Shah flees the country. The armed forces refuse to fight, and the Iranian Revolution becomes possible. All revolutions, violence is often a part of revolution, but revolution comes when the, enough of a mass of people, enough of them, stand up and speak truth and defy systems of authority and touch the conscience of the foot soldiers of the elite. Those who are tasked with using coercion to defend a corrupt and discredited minority. We've watched the configurations, the legal configurations, because they know what's coming. They've run scenario after scenario. Financial collapse, climate disintegration, wholesale surveillance. Don't be fooled by it. The shenanigans. Re read closely in the articles about grandfather clauses, and they, they're still getting everything they want. And what do we have? It's called the Freedom Act now. 
Um, court after court has stripped us by judicial fiat of our most basic constitutional rights. And as many of you know, I sued Barack Obama in federal court over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. This is an act that allows the U.S. military on the streets of American cities to seize American citizens who substantially support, that's not a legal term, that's not material support, El -Talib the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or something called associated forces, another nebulous term, strip them of due process, and hold them indefinitely in military facilities. And we won, to the surprise of the White House, in the Southern District Court of New York. And when Judge Catherine Forrest wrote her 112-page opinion, she said, this opens the possibility to criminalize an entire group of people. And she brought up the internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. And the reaction of the Obama administration was very telling. We knew it would appeal, and we knew they'd appeal. But it didn't just appeal. They sent attorneys from the national security apparatus to Judge Forrest Chambers and demanded that she lift her temporary injunction and put the law back into effect until the Second Circuit would hear the appeal. To her credit, she refused. And the New York Times wrote an editorial praising her decision the next day. That Monday, that was on a Friday, Monday morning, 9 o'clock, they're in front of the Second Circuit and they make the same demand and the Second Circuit concedes and puts the law back into effect. Why? Why? Because they're already using the law. Probably against U.S. Pakistani, U.S. Afghan, dual nationals in black sites in Bagram or somewhere else. Now what was the Second Circuit going to do? They were going to do what all of the courts have done, especially since 9-11. They were never going to rule on the constitutionality because it's patently unconstitutional to use the military as domestic police force. And so I was part of a lawsuit in front of the Supreme Court called Clapper versus Amnesty International on the FISA Amendment Act on warrantless wiretapping, which we had challenged before the Snowden revelations. The government attorneys got up in the Supreme Court and said, Any charge that these journalists are being monitored is speculation, and if they were being monitored, the government would tell them. <laughs> and they threw it out. The Supreme Court believed them. And so the Second Circuit waited, and they said, look, Hedges doesn't have standing in Clapper versus Amnesty International as a plaintiff, therefore he doesn't have standing in Hedges versus Obama, and it's out. And this is now law. All of the mechanisms they have to keep us under control, what Hannah Arendt called these omnipotent police forces, where legally people are stripped of their rights, and you create a physical mechanism as we have with militarized police. And as Arendt says, the moment a society starts to disintegrate, when you have those mechanisms, the physical mechanisms, of militarized police who can act with impunity, and laws that do not protect the citizenry, then essentially you can create that martial law which has been restricted for a part of the population for the whole population. What happens next? is up to us. We live in a moment that Antonio Gramsci, the great Italian revolutionary theorist, called an interregnum. People have lost faith in the system. Congress's approval rating is about 7%. People don't vote in national elections. And yet, we have yet to articulate a vision to take its place. Alexander Berkman writes about revolutions 
calls it in his essay, Invisible Revolution, that that moment when the ideas which are built around sustaining unfettered capitalism, neoliberalism, when those ideas lose their efficacy, but you don't have new ideas to take their place, there's an unseen turmoil within the society, like water boiling in a kettle. What will happen? When will it happen? No one knows. I was in Leipzig on September, on November 9th, 1989, with the leaders of the East German uprising. And they said, maybe within a year we'll have free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall. By that evening, the Berlin Wall, at least as an impediment to human traffic, did not exist. Howell understood it. And I was spent every night during the Velvet Revolution in the Magic Lantern Theater with Howell and Klaus and Dinsbier. That it is that capacity to live in truth and without fear. Because the, the state knows how discredited it is. And it's fearful that it's going to be found out. I was with many 133 members of Veterans for Peace, Vietnam veterans, Iraqi war veterans, Afghan war veterans, in front of the White House a couple years ago. In winter, it was snowing. Watermelon Slim, great blues musician, played taps on his harmonica. Several of the veterans folded the flag from a young man who killed a week before in Afghanistan. And then someone slowly beat a drum. And everybody marched silently to the White House gates where we were arrested. And as we were being handcuffed with our hands behind our back, the police, who it turns out were in the National Guard and had been in Iraq and Afghanistan, would whisper, keep protesting these wars. This truly terrifies the state. When the Chicago teachers marched through the city streets of Chicago and went into the precinct houses and the police applauded, this terrifies the state. When mothers and fathers came into Zuccotti Park on the weekends and pushed their strollers up and down Zuccotti, past the drummers and the People's Library, this terrified the state. But we have to get out. We have to resist. You have to stop Kinder Morgan. Inspector. Inspector. Special Inspector. Everybody has to go find junk cars that nobody wants. And when these bulldozers and machines come to build that pipeline, you have to drive them into the streets, leave them, and take the battery with you and go home. <laughs> and you have to do it day in and day out. Because it's only acts like that that are going to save us. Acts that appeal to the conscience of everyone around you. And that's the power of nonviolence. It resonates outward. That's what Havel understood. However lonely, and isolated and ineffectual it may appear at the moment, it ripples forward into the conscience of everyone around you. I was, as I said, in Prague that winter and on the streets were posters of a young Charles University student, Jan Pollock, who, to protest the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and the overthrow of Dubček in 68, had gone to Wenceslas Square and lit himself on fire. 
He died of his burns four days later. The students who were carrying his coffin from Charles University, a non-event ever reported in the state media, were prevented from reaching the cemetery by the police. When his grave became a shrine, his body was exhumed, he was cremated, his ashes were given to his mother, and she was told that she was not allowed to rebury them. A week after the communist government fell, 10,000 Czechs marched to Red Army Square and renamed it Jan Pollock Square. I was in Wenceslas Square when Marta Kubasheva, the greatest folk singer in Czechoslovakia, who, during the 1968 invasion, had gone on the radio to sing the anthem of defiance called A Prayer for Marta, walked out onto the balcony in front of 500,000 Czechs. After the Soviet overthrow, her recording stock was destroyed. She was prohibited from ever being broadcast on the airwaves. She had spent the intervening years on an assembly line in a toy factory, and when she began to sing the prayer for Martha, every check in the crowd knew every word. That is the power of resistance. It requires us to stand up. It's a moral imperative. It is an act of faith. It is the belief that the good draws to it the good. The good insofar as we can determine it. And then we have to let it go. The Buddhists call it karma. But faith is the belief that it goes somewhere. I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And that is the moral imperative to revolt. And all it requires is for us to stand up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. We are now going to open the floor for questions. If you raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. I wonder what blowback we've gotten from the government for speaking out like this. Uh, <coughs> I get kind of obnoxious questioning when I come back into the country. I mean, I'll give you an example. I came back from Canada recently, and so they pulled me up on the screen, and their whole demeanor kind of changes because they realize I'm, I'm on a watch list. I know I'm on a watch list because I was stopped at the Newark airport coming back from Italy. I've been invited by the uh, regional government in Florence, which is the Communist Party, to address all of their graduating high school students, 10,000 of them in an auditorium. And when I got back, um, they wouldn't let me into the country even though I had a valid passport. They put me in a room with people who they had thought were, had forged their visas. I always carry a book with me, so it's all right. And uh, after an hour, the supervisor came over to the guy behind the computer and said, all right, he's on a watch, tell me he can go. So I know I'm on a watch. Uh, but, you know, I get back, like I came back recently from Winnipeg, and, and the guy pulls up my file and said, why are you coming back from Winnipeg? You usually come back from Montreal. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I usually come back from Toronto. He said, don't tell me, I have your file right here. But they're wrong, so don't put too much faith in the NSA. I usually do come back from Toronto. <laughs> In your article in Truth Day, June 1st, you mentioned 
the title of Marx was right, of the decline of capitalism, but he never included the issue of the bomb. Of what? The bomb. In other words, the bomb? The, yeah, it's his name. The hydrogen bomb, atomic bomb. That that may also be invoked by the power. Yeah. Um, I mean, unfortunately, there's no weapon that's been invented by humankind that hasn't been used. And of course, we committed the greatest terrorist act in human history, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, non-military targets, um, wiping out the civilians in Japanese cities to send a message to Stalin. Um, but yeah, there's only so much you can mention in the I was more focused on Mark. That was actually an event that you know I did with Rick Wolf and Gail Dines. So be, I was totally terrified. Um, so I sweated. That was the talk I gave, but I totally sweated over it. And had to read it first because I didn't want to make sure I made any mistakes. Thank you. Um, so you at the lunch forum over this weekend, Chris. And um, uh, first of all, I want to say that the person you mentioned, Mississippi, a watermelon slim. It's probably known to some people here. That's Bill Homans Jr., whose father, Bill Homans, was an amazing guy and a great civil uh, civil rights uh, lawyer here in Boston. Bill Homans Jr. is now a watermelon slim, continues to work with the Vietnam veterans against the war, and uh, does, is a great musician. He's actually over in Italy, I think, right now on a tour. Um, we, you know, three or 4,000 people, I don't know how many gather every year at the left forum, for example. All of these people, zillions of topics, panel discussions about, is it time for a, a, a left, you know, an independent party? Uh, questions like that come up year after year. Um, you talked about Czech Czechoslovakia, there's nothing stopping us in, in some ways. There's nothing preventing us from organizing ourselves if we want to. Um, and yet somehow we can't manage to bring ourselves to do that. Could you talk about, you know, this challenge of, and Ralph Nader spoke yesterday in New York, uh, and, and, and he, you know, th that topic came up, and, you know, breaking this corporate two-party monopoly of power that everybody knows is, is not serving us, but, you know, we all just seem to not be willing to do, or not understand what might work to, to change it. So, could you talk about that? Well, they have very effective mechanisms of propaganda based on fear. Um, and that's all the two parties offer. So, if you're part of the right wing, it's fear that, um, you know, uh, there'll be abortion clinics on every street corner and homosexuals teaching in your kindergarten, I don't know what else, other crazy stuff. If it's the, it, you know, if it's the liberal class, it's the fear that, you know, all the yahoos are going to take over, or they are kind of yahoos, but that's all the two parties have to offer is fear. And in fact, neither party ever delivers. I mean, Bush didn't come in and ban abortions. Um, a Bush served corporate interest as assiduously as Bill Clinton had served corporate interest, as assiduously as Barack Obama served corporate interest. Um, so part of it is the manipulation of propaganda, and this is part of my anger with Sanders, because he's playing the role that Van Jones played in the last election, which is, well, they're not perfect, but it's the Democrats. And we've just got to get over that. Um, I have had long discussions with Shama Sawa, a social She's amazing. I just had dinner with her, uh, well, I was at a, a, I'm going out to kick off her campaign rally, by the way, on June 6th. Um, and of course, the whole Democratic establishment, not just in the state of Washington, has ganged up on her because they can't allow a self-declared socialist even to sit on the city council. And you saw how that campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 in Seattle migrated to LA, and they don't want it to migrate anywhere else. And so I think locally, we can get behind radical candidates having worked with Ralph. I know all of the impediments that they throw up in terms of a national election. However, we're looking closely at Cereza in Greece, and there has to be a political arm that gives a voice to movements like Black Lives Matter, raising the minimum wage, the debt jubilee. It, there needs that political arm. Uh, with the idea that that political arm 
it serves the interests of the movements. It doesn't see elections as an end in itself. And, um, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but you won't tell anybody. Um, we are talking about maybe even holding a kind of Woodstock national convention uh, where everyone can come and all the groups can come and we essentially create this political win. The problem is that she's got to win her the resources of socialist alternatives and has to go right now towards her re-election campaign. Um, I, I'm not an organizer, I don't want to be a politician, and I don't, but I think it's a good idea. Um, and I'm watching, what, what's happening in Greece is, is a political battle between the international, it's nothing to do with economics, because they've got tons of money to dump in the Ukraine. Um, it has to do with the fear of the international corporate elite that Greece will get out of the Eurozone and survive. And it, this could come down within two weeks. And if they walk out of the Eurozone, they will do to Greece what they did to Allende in Chile. They will try and strangle Greece. Fuel shortages, bread lines, you know, uh, uh, power outages, all the mechanisms they can use to try and restore a right-wing corporate oligarchic elite to power. But if Greece makes it, Spain is next, and Ireland may be next. And, and that's, when I talk in the book about how revolutions come in waves, I mean, this is not my idea, it's the idea of historians who study revolutions. So you have the American Revolution, which triggers the French Revolution, which triggers the Haitian Revolution, and a series of revolts, including in Ireland, throughout Europe, many of which are not successful, but, you know, if Greece makes it, then that wave, I think, will begin uh, to roll forward. Um, but I think part of it is a failure on the part of the left to understand the configurations of power. Because if we keep thinking, you know, that Elizabeth Warren is going to save us, or that, you know, Bernie Sanders, then we haven't understood that we've undergone a corporate coup d'etat, and it's over. They've won. And that at this point, the only language we should speak is the language of overthrow. I'll repeat that. I'll repeat that for Homeland Security overthrow uh, of the corporate state because these people are strangling us to death, literally. And, and, and what they are driving us downward, I mean, that's why prisons are insist important. I think it was Dostoevsky who said, if you want to understand the measure of a civilization, look at his prisons. But everywhere that corporations have unlimited power, watch what they do. Watch what they do in prison. Watch what they do in West Virginia. Watch what they do in the inner cities. Uh, because, as Karl Marx understood, unfettered capitalism is a revolutionary force. It has no internal mechanisms to limit exploitation. And now, with the lifting of external mechanisms of control, it will do what it is designed to do, which is to exploit until exhaustion or collapse. And, and we have to understand the configuration of power first, because if we keep responding to the illusion of a functioning democratic system, if we keep believing that reform is somehow possible, I wish it was. I don't like the chaos. It's not something I want. But we just don't live in that kind of a system. And so I think part of the problem, certainly among much of the liberal class, and maybe even some of the left, is they have yet to read power as it is. That's why Roland is so important. Yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And also please permit me to disagree with you on some very key issues. For example, I don't believe that it's over. And uh, I also personally think heroism is vastly overrated. I think it's very unimportant, whereas effectiveness is very important. And uh, I think the key is, as somebody else said, don't more organize, like someone else here has already said. And uh, that organizing, I think all of us are capable of. We don't have to be heroes to do it. 
I'm making a point, and the point is that, um, as you said, uh, Chris, the most important and most fundamental um, barrier to that organizing is that we have been inculcated with the belief that some people are more valuable than others, and that if we're white and upper class and educated uh, or somehow different, and if someone is does not have a high school uh, diploma, they don't dare to speak up. So I think it is our job to reach out across uh, those divisions and organize at the most smallest, smallest, smallest level we can. There's Jobs with Justice right here in Jamaica Plain. There's the worker centers that organize the undocumented workers, and those are the people we can work with and make a huge difference. And my last point, it is much, much more fun than, uh, you know, all the distractions that, uh, that we distract ourselves with from our depression and our despair. Well, I don't know how to describe what my students did in that prison without using the word "bro." Yep. This will be the last question for the evening, and then Chris will be available back. And, and, let, let, and let me just say, you have a beautiful independent bookstore here. That is a cultural treasure. I have watched bookstore, independent bookstore after independent bookstore get shuttered in Manhattan as the entire island has been taken over by hedge fund managers, most of whom should be in prison, unlike the students I teach. And we you have to don't go on Amazon to buy my book or any book. Go to the bookstore. It's called Shortcuts, right? Paper cuts. Paper cuts. Go to paper. I do not go on Amazon. I walk down to my local bookstore labyrinth and I order every book I want. And if it costs a dollar or two more, I pay it. So please, support this independent bookstore. Keep it in Jamaica Plain. And you can support it and help keep boys like mine going by buying a book tonight from Paper Fest. What? Mr. Parsons. Yes, we also have two other bookstores, Trace Gatton and the Lucy Parsons Center. They'll all sell this book. <laughs> Uh, I, this is actually not a question, but we, I think you left out one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of what you're talking about when the, when the soldiers or the police begin to respect what the leftists are doing is the Vietnam War itself, which stopped when soldiers began to understand what was going on in, about the protests that were going back here. They stopped fighting, and they had to withdraw. And, and, and I congratulate you for recognizing that that was one of the major things that, that can really change. We'll do one more question. That was, we had two statements. <laughs> Some minutes of questions. So, uh, I'd actually like to bring it back to nuclear weapons, because I think uh, the fact that we're dumping so much money into defense, that's one thing that's limiting our freedom. Right. In terms of the very simple fact that we have considerably less money to spend on the things that right. really matter. And uh, all those weapons are doing, of course, is maintaining our hegemony, and Russia's weapons are doing the same, and et cetera, and so forth. I think that's quite obvious. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on uh, somehow getting through to people who are uh, in service to, uh, to the elites, the, the, the scientists, the physicists who are currently working on modernizing right. our uh, nuclear forces. Right. Well, you know, the House, the House just passed an appropriations bill where they, over the next 10 years, have allocated $345 billion to refurbishing our nuclear weapons, building 12 Ohio-class submarines at $8 billion apiece, 
um, 600 and some billion dollar, but, that, but of course we spent about a trillion dollars because they hide a lot of it. And you know, the most dangerous institution in American society is the military industrial complex. It is doing what institutions like these do in the, in the end or the data of an empire, which is hollowing the country out from the inside. Um, and as it follows the country out from the inside, it uses the forces of coercion on the outer reaches of empire, drones, wholesale surveillance, um, you know, militarized force to maintain control uh, increasingly inside empire. So that's why you're seeing all of these mechanisms that are familiar to those of us who covered empire, or you know, covered the wars with an empire, now appearing on the streets of American cities, um, and, and this is part of my problem with Sanders, because he's not confronting the military, um, he, you know, he's been supportive of these wars, he's terrible on Israel-Palestine, refusing to stand up and, and uh, condemn the war crimes that are being carried out by Israel against the Palestinian people, and as even someone who spent so long in Gaza, that issue alone. You're either, we are at a point in history now where you're either going to stand up for all of the oppressed or none of the oppressed. You can't pick and choose which oppressed group you know, is convenient um, because the oppressed have no patience, nor should they, with that. Um, so yeah, I think that, that this issue is, is not spoken about, and it's absolutely key, and they have total power, and of course, they control our intelligence agency, which is why figures like Pelosi are frightened of. How do you get through to the physicists? I mean, the problem is, and this gets back to Aaron and other writers on totalitarianism, is that people build ideologically, ideological systems around what is convenient for them. They, they, they rationalize what is good for them. And it's very hard to break through that. Um, and that gets to the issue of power. When you give people a certain amount of power, and you give people a stake in a system, even when it's unjust, then that privilege, as I said at the beginning of my talk, creates a willful blindness. Because it's not in your interest to ask, or at least in not in your immediate material interest to ask. And that's why the people who see most clearly are people who have been stripped of power. And that is why the most intelligent discussions about power I have ever had as a professor in my life have never taken place in a Princeton classroom, but in the prisons that I teach. Thank you.